we'll now be looking at time in homogeneous continuous time Markov chains. And in this event, we, or this case, we allow the transition rate to vary with time or any transition rate to vary with time. And the implication is that the conditional probabilities, in order to calculate them, you don't just care about the amount of time that you spend under observation, you also care about when you started. So because the, the, the rate is changing over time, it also matters um, the beginning and the end time that you're asking for your conditional probability. This uh, table is just a copy from your notes, uh, putting together in one place all the equations that are analogous to your time homogeneous case. So here at the front, you can see uh, the chapman Kolmogorov. This time we just have two parameters floating around. So it's very simple, very similar. Uh, then we have our transition rates. You can see this is the definition of the transition rates uh, where this value changes uh, to one if we care about, if i is equal to j, otherwise it being zero. And uh, we are particularly interested because we're fixing the point at which we start, we are, particularly interested in the derivative with respect to t, the second parameter. So this just points, you know, we now have to move from um, normal derivatives to partial derivatives. Um, here you can see the forward and backwards differential equations, very similar compared to before. And the holding time is now not quite exponentially distributed. It's exponentially distributed, but where there's an integral in the exponent of e. So they're all very similar. Um, some of them are given some proofs in the notes uh, and you'll see they are essentially identical to what we've had before. We're going to do an easy and intermediate and a difficult example. I'm gonna start with the easy example. Um, it says state the conditions needed for a Markov jump process to be time inhomogeneous. Um, for that, we just need um, at least one transition rate to change over time. That is the definition. Describe the principal difficulties in modeling using a Markov jump process with time inhomogeneous rates. Well, there are three um, difficulties that jump to mind. Firstly is the obvious, slightly more complex algebra, and in some cases, significantly more complex algebra, um, which just, you know, it's, it's not to say that it, it's just a lot more pages of writing. Sometimes there'll be equations that are more difficult or impossible to get closed form solutions for, or something that might not be uh, possible to get a solution for. So the algebra could actually be, it's not just a matter of will, it's also a matter of complexity and some of it might not be surmountable. Uh, the second obvious issue, I think, is um, complex computation. So even if you sorted out all your formulas and you can um, program them in R, it might take really long um, for a differential equation to be solved, uh, for a simulation to run. So more complex computation. Thirdly is because we are now interested in f uh, functions for transition rates, there'll be more parameters to estimate. So more parameters to estimate and that comes with its normal data issues. So more data required to estimate model parameters reliably. Okay. Um, obviously introducing more parameters um, introduces the risk of overfitting. So I guess we could put that as a fourth point. It is for two marks uh, um, after all. So we can say risk of overfitting data. Now we start with the numerical question. 
um, a multitasking a multitasking worker at a children's nursery observes whether children are being good or naughty at all times. Her observation, uh, observations suggest that the probability of a child moving between two states vary with time since the child arrived at the nursery in the morning. So it's a two-state process. Um, children are jumping between naughty and good, good to naughty. Um, and these are the changing transition rates. And time is just a work, a work day, eight hours. Um, a child starts off in the good state in the morning at 9 a.m. Okay. Now they ask, so here you, it's always worth drawing the diagram. Here I've done that for you. Uh, even simple diagrams are useful to keep track of what's happening. Calculate the probability that a child is good for all time up until t. So as in the time homogeneous case, we know that the holding time is exponentially distributed. So you'll see that the formulas, as we have it here, it uh, jumps straight to the exponent. You might remember from, um, from first year that the exponential, di uh, exponential distribution, the cumulative distribution is one minus E. Um, and the reason we have uh, just the simple E in the holding time formula is because we're, in we're saying what's the probability that a child is good for all the time up to T or longer. So it's just the upper end of the cumulative distribution. Um, you, can ignore, you can ignore this piece if you want. Um, you could have just gone straight to the equation that we had on the slide two slides back. So it's just the derivative of staying in the good state. So we've just plugged this piece in there, um, differentiated, and we find the probability um, of stay, starting off in the good state and staying there. That's why we have the bar at the top. The holding time. Okay. Next, uh, we are asked to calculate the time by which there is at least a 50% chance of the child having been naughty at some point. So the implication is that the, the probability of a, a child moving to the naughty state is increasing um, above 50% as, at some point during the day. To to know what the probability is that someone, that a child is at, you know, in the naughty state at least once is one minus the probability of never having left the good state. So um, it's important the bar there is missing from, um, from my writing there. PGG would have allowed for the possibility of a kid moving to the naughty state and having come back. I've said this before, but it is um, an important distinction. So it's one minus the probability of having never left the good state is equal to the probability of having been in the naughty state at least once. And we just want to know that probability greater than 0 0.5. We have um, the expression from the previous question. Um, and then we have some odd coefficients that we have to use a normal quadratic formula. Uh, there's a negative answer and a positive answer. And because we're working with time, it has to be the positive answer. Cool, easy two mark question. Oh, that should stay. Next, they say let PG be the probability that a child is in the good state at time T. So that's equivalent, just in terms of notation, that is the same as PGG. Uh, we're only saying we know uh, we're interested in someone who has started off in the good state at time zero. So that's why they the notation looks a little bit different to our standard notation. Um, derive a differential equation just involving PG, which could be used to determine the probability that a child is good on leaving the nursery at 5 p.m. So they're just looking for either a forward or a backwards differential equation for PGG. And here we have, um, we here I'm using the forward differential equation. So here we have mu gg and here we have mu ng and gg is in the um the diagonal of the matrix and that's why we have a negatives in front of um, that transition rate uh, multiplying it out um, in two state models we have a nice and sometimes in the three state models uh, we have a nice relationship between these conditional probabilities we know that um that Gn is equal to one minus Pgg, because you can only be in one of two places. 
Um, so you don't actually have to go now in the next step, write out the conditional um, or the Kolmogorov forward or differentially, uh, backward differential equation for that expression as well. You can uh, reduce it just to PGG by taking one minus. Um, and then if you simplify it a little bit further, we can also now write PGG, bring this over. And what you should realize at this point is that this can be solved using the integrating factor method. So if you remember, the integrating factor method takes E to the integral of what is next to this piece of the function. 0.6 dt. Um, so we know our integrating factor is E to the 0.6 t. You multiply that out all the way through um, and then integrate between 0 and t. Um, I'll leave that to you because that's just some standard manipulation. Okay, we're now on to the intermediate example. Um, this is an example I made up and I think it um, shows us, uh, it really illustrates a lot of things at once. So this is one question I think worth doing uh, in complete detail. Um, it shows you how something like a very simple model can bring a hell of a lot of uh, clarity to a problem um, and also uh, shows you how massively uh, more accurate we can estimate parameters with the data that we've got. So let's start with the details. You are, an, you are 80 years and six months old and exactly six months ago on your birthday, presumably, you had your 57th class reunion since leaving university. Only 10 people attended the last reunion. On the first day of every month, you check in with each of your nine colleagues. Assume only that your rate of mortality doubles every eight years. What is your probability of dying before the next reunion? A little bit of a morbid question, um, but it's important to me to, um, to look at older um, mortality because things are really changing month on month for people at that age. So we're interested in the probability of moving from alive to dead in the next six months, where we're going to allow, uh, so we've got a simple two-state model, alive and dead. And we just want this mortality rate to vary over time. And that's why we now ask the conditional probability between month six and month 12, and we are currently at month six. Firstly, I just want to point out, we are assuming the Markov property in our model here. And um, the question is, what does the Markov property mean and is it a reasonable assumption to make? Well, if you find yourself in the alive state, you automatically know that you've been in the alive state up until that point. If you are in the dead state, we have forgotten at what point you would have died, because this is a Markov process. After every iteration, we forget the state. We only know the state that we came from in the, in the last split second. We don't know the history of the process. So it's true that we, if we're in the dead state, we have lost the information about when we died, but we're not interested in any information about being in the dead state. We're not interested in um, that kind of information. So in this case, the, the Markov property actually isn't an assumption at all. It's completely logical, completely reasonable assumption to make. And that's why you'll see the conclusion, the, the formulas that we derive from it are completely intuitive. So the Markov property, completely reasonable. Reasonable assumption. Okay, before I, make some observations, let's just look at the data. So we start with the age at which everyone was at the last reunion. We have some lives that are still alive by the end of the six months. We have um, two people, three people who have, um, who have passed away. And um, sorry, there we go, those three people have passed away. We have someone that we've lost contact with, in other words, some censored data. And we have also, also have someone who has turned 81 um, 
during, during this time. And we're very clearly interested in people aged 86 until they become 81. So that's some more in examples of censored data. And then here on the far right, we clearly have some statistic that's getting calculated. And it'll become obvious later that that is a statistic that we're interested in. Um, there's absolutely no intuitive explanation for this, but later on, um, it is important to understand how these, um, these expressions vary by life. Okay, but we will get definitely get back to using this. And normally a question will give you some statistics if it's trying to uh, save you time on the calculator typing things out. So that's um, what this table is giving you. Um, so yes, we have, um, we have all the information we need for a Markov chain. We have the number of transitions between the states and the amount of time that people have spent in those states. Okay, I just wanted to make two observations before we begin. We have, we're making this one assumption, assumption that mortality doubles every eight years. So that can just be expressed as our mortality uh, moving eight time periods down the line being doubled. We can take uh, the mu to the other side and we can differentiate and, uh, and bring that expression back. So this is true and this is true, which keep in mind normally when you differentiate um, a fraction, you'll have to use the quotient rule of differentiation. So it's not normally true that you can just say the der derivative of that expression is the derivative of the top minus the bottom. In fact, it can be shown that um, and you can even show it yourselves, it's really easy to do, that it's only the exponential distribution that has this property. So um, we know that our um, transition rate has to take that form with two parameters to estimate, A and B, T. Okay. And um, you can even see it from here. If we now plug it into this equation, we see that the A's will cancel, the TB's will cancel, and we'll just be left with a numerical answer for B. Okay. So our assumption that we've made here at the start actually get, forced us to take a numerical value for B. It basically reflects the way that mortality changes um, for a population of a species only attributable to aging. So, you know, for, I think it's for fruit flies and a whole bunch of other animals, this idea of your mortality doubling every eight years um, is generally true. And we're br bringing that information, a sort of an outside piece of information into our model. Um, you'll actually find that many mortality curves, including the standard ones, uses, kind of uses this fact in the graduating of rates. Um, so you'll actually find that this relationship holds in some of our standard tables. Very importantly though, this is not a maximum likelihood estimate. This was an assumption we made in the model, okay? A maximum likelihood estimate writes down the likelihood function, which is the probability that you observe the data that you did and it maximizes the parameter um, with respect to that function. That's as an MLE. So if you have two parameters, um, in the, as we have in this case, we could have calculated the maximum likelihood estimate by jointly maximizing the marginal um, derivatives with respect to A and B. But because we've made this assumption, we are only calculating the maximum likelihood of A, given that we've already calculated B. So I just thought I'd use a nice example of not all, all estimates are maximum likelihood estimates. It's just uh, maximum likelihood estimate is the best estimate you can have um, in light of not having any prior information about your parameter. And here we're saying we actually have some prior information about beta, and I mean, not beta, about B, and that will dictate um, the parameter of the model. I just also, as a second observation, wanted to um, forget about stats uh, for a second and just say, how would a naive person look at this problem? Well, a naive person might say, what if the second half of the year is the same as the first half of the year? What is your probability of dying? Well, we said here that we had three, we can count three deaths, and we had 10 uh, people under observation, including yourself. 
So why not just say it's 3 over 10, 0.3? The number of deaths over the number alive at the start. Um, a naive person might also say, yeah, well, but we lost contact with one person. So we don't know if that person died or not. So maybe we should exclude that person from our data. In that case, we would say um, the probability is 10 minus 1 in the denominator and 0.3 reoccurring. You can keep criticizing um, this naive estimate, but this question will allow us to calculate the right estimate. And you'll, we'll, we'll then see, allowing for this extra assumption, how, how does our final answer vary from this very naive answer? Okay, so here we have the transition diagram. This fully defines the model. We already know B, B's estimate. So we, now we are just trying to um, find out what A, the maximum likelihood of A hat is. So we start by writing down the likelihood function. Um, and deriving this likelihood function is relevant to an earlier piece where we did it more generally for the healthy sick dead model. So here I'm doing it in detail for the two state and it's, it's very simple to extend it to, to three states. Um, but for each life, we have three unknowns. The time that we, uh, the, the time at the beginning of the observation or their age at the start of the observation. Um, so time since their 80th birthday, which is just how old they were at the start of, observ uh, of the observation. BI, which is the time since the 80th birthday that the observation stopped. Okay. And lastly, an indicator about whether that life died or not. And this set of three parameters actually ni nicely um, su uh, summarizes the data in this table. We have three pieces of information for every life, whether they died or not, and how long they were under observation. Obviously, intuitively, this person who we lost contact with, we still knew they were alive until a month ago. So a naive estimate excluding that life feels a little bit like a waste. There's some information in there, even though it shouldn't contribute as much as if we knew that they were still alive at the, uh, at the end of the period, they should still contribute in some way. So the likelihood function um, is the product of all the marginal distributions for each life across all lives. And this likelihood function is um, this, this expression is still true whether or not some of the lives are dis under a discrete um, uh, random variable or a continuous random variable. So if we first look at the case where lives don't die, someone either died or didn't at the end of the period. It's just the probability that they were alive during the period. So that for, for those lives who don't die, the marginal distribution is actually discrete. And it is the holding time expression. It's the probability that a life started off as alive and, and still ended as alive between A1, AI and BI. So we have for those lives a discrete um, distribution. For lives that are dying during the period, we are saying that there's actually, a, for someone dying exactly at one point in time, um, the probability is zero. Um, but th it, it got observed, it will, so even though in a continuous distribution, the probability of hitting a particular value is exactly zero, it's not impossible for that to actually be the value. So for lives who died, we actually have a continuous distribution. And we want to know the probability of going from alive to dead. Um, but we, because we are, multiply, we are multiplying out the marginal distributions here in the likelihood function, we actually want the derivative of that expression. Um, and we want to calculate the, der the, the derivative with respect to bi. So we're actually looking for something of a derivative with respect to something that sits there in the top part of, um, of an integral. Um, if you think you've never done this kind of derivative before, please look at your first year calculus. There's something called the fundamental law of calculus, the first fundamental law of calculus, and it literally expresses um, the derivative with respect to something 
there in the top part of a um, of the integral. So we actually know that the marginal distribution for going from alive to dead is this expression by the first law, the first fundamental law of calculus. Please check it out if that doesn't sound familiar to you. Um, and now we are ready to write out our likelihood function. For lives that are where d is equal to zero, in other words, alive at the end of the period, we have the discrete um, distribution. And for those lives that are continuous or, in, or had a death during the year, just three, five, and seven, um, for those lives, we have this second um, probability distribution. We always take the logs of the likelihood to make, to make things simple, but you'll see that this first part of the expression, whether you are, whether you died or not, this expression is actually the same between the lives with a continuous and a discrete distribution. Um, so we can actually rearrange that a bit and only leave this part that is unique um, to the dead lives. We've taken the logs, we've rearranged a few things, and we find that this is our log likelihood function. This expression is where we now substitute in the form of the equation that we've got, and that's how we're going to differentiate with respect to A. We can assume that B is already estimated. So on the next slide, I'm just differentiating the likelihood function with respect to A after plugging in the mu t that changes with A. And we find that A is equal to B hat times the sum of one across all dead, so that's just equal to three, divided by the statistic for each life. And that is what was provided in the table over here. Okay, so when you plug everything in, you'll actually see that um, we get A of 0 0.0418, but that only gives us the parameters for our model. So now we know we have um, mu t is equal to A hat times E to the B hat, which was um, lin two over eight, lin two over eight T. That just gives us our transition rate. We still have to go calculate the probability of going from um, alive to dead between times uh, month six and month 12, which is what we're interested in. And we find that it is 42%. So 42% is significantly higher than our naive estimates, but it allows properly for two facts. The fact that we know that at this age, mortality is really jumping every six months. It is really increasing quickly, uh, which is a fact that we cannot ignore. Um, and we are also um, accounting properly for the information that we got from this life that we lost under observation. So, all this math that we have done has had these two benefits of um, including information properly uh, and including all the information that we have. And there's, it's, not, it's a significant difference um, in probability guesses. Just to compare it, if we were to look at this as a homogeneous uh, process, we'll actually get something pretty close to the naive estimate. So the... Um, you know, I, I feel that this shows quite nicely that a time inhomogeneous process, how it adds a lot of information and a lot of an increasing amount of accuracy in our modeling. This is the uh, third example of a time inhomogeneous model. Um, and it is actually the, the same question from the introduction. An entrepreneur has enough savings to cover their business expenses for a maximum of six months. Should they ever become too sick to work 
What is the probability that the entrepreneur is too sick to work today and has been too sick to work for more than six months? So basically they've run out of money, given that they were healthy when they started their business five years ago. And just to refresh your memory, we said there are three things um, that we want to model. Firstly, we want to make sure that um, the chances or probability of the chances that's changes, the chances um, of getting sick changes with age or time. We want to make sure that the probabilities account for the history of illness of the individual, including future history. <laughs> and what I mean by future history is in the future, someone is going to become sick and that is going to contribute to them actually building up a sickness record. We cannot forget the sort of future medical history that a person is building up. Um, and thirdly, the probability of staying in the sick state changes with time. If someone has been sick for only a month, um, it tells us a lot more than if someone had been uh, claiming for five years. Uh, because if you have been claiming for that long, the chances that you'll recover in the next month might be significantly lower or the other way around, depending on the illness. Um, so what we called them in the introduction lecture, we just said these were deal breakers. I didn't say these are a complete list of requirements that we have for a model. But if our model doesn't capture these three things, it probably isn't very realistic. Um, in this chapter, we've already dealt with what happens um, if your chances of getting sick changes um, with time and age, and that's exactly what we have, um, you know, by just having a rate that changes with time in a healthy sick dead model, we would have accounted for this, uh, for this first requirement done. Um, the probability of accounting for someone's sickness history, we're going to park for now, but we're going to get to that at the end. In this next slide, I want to deal with the, the probability of someone being in the sick state, that probability changing with time. So depending on how long they've been in the sick state, um, the probabilities should change. So we have our normal healthy sick dead model. This time we have sickness, mortality, and mortality from the sick state changing with uh, time. But we now have our recovery rates changing with time and another random variable. And that random variable is the duration of time in the sick state. Um, so simply requiring that we can, we're, we can just write the probability that we're interested in as we said, did uh, before we said, what's the probability of a life being in the sick state at time T given that they have been sick for longer than W at this point, given that they were in the healthy state at time S. Okay. I guess that could be potentially confusing. That this S is a time, not this doesn't refer to uh, sickness. Um, so the probability at time S of being in the healthy state, what's the probability that you're in the sick state at time healthy T, given that you have been sick uh, for a time W. So we're just solving it um, in the most general way. And it comes with practice, but the, this is the full expression um, that represents that probability. Um, it looks very daunting, uh, but you'll see that if you break it down from left to right, it becomes much more tractable. Um, in all fairness, these kinds of questions do come up quite rarely in exams, um, but they come up often enough that it's worth doing a whole bunch of examples until you feel familiar uh, with writing expressions like this. So let's start uh, firstly with the uh, we know this is a continuous question. You could be getting sick at any point in time. So this is um, the integral on the outside of the expression. 
Um, it ranges from W to T minus S because those are the extremes that we could be observing. So you should see W as, um, you know, this five years ago part of the question. So in the shortest amount of time, someone has been sick today for exactly five years. So that's the, the lower bound of the question. The upper bound of the question says, actually someone had already been sick for five years, just, just after um, time S. So they've been sick for T minus S. Um, they've been sick for longer than five years already for T minus S time. So these are the two extremes that we, uh, two extreme situations that we have in this question, and that's why they form the bounds of the outside integral. Okay, it's always worth writing out a timeline for these questions. So the form it takes is someone starts off in healthy at time S, and then they are allowed to go into the sixth state as often as they, as they want to in this period in between. But at time V, they, we know that is the last time they switched to the sixth state, and they stayed in the sixth state all the way until today. So we just introduced a new variable V there. Um, now we look at the probabilities from left to right. So first we say, what's the probability that someone started in a healthy state at time S and that they were back in the healthy state at time T minus V. So they're allowed to have been sick as many times as they wanted to. Times the instantaneous probability that someone went from the healthy to the sick state at time t minus v. And now we want the probability that that person stayed in the sick state for the whole duration. And we know that that holding time is exponentially distributed all the way from time t minus v to t. And we know if you're in the sick state, the diagonal consists of the row function and the new function. That is why there's a minus on the outside here, but the summation of them on the inside. And all this is, uh, all that we have here on the inside is saying that this row chain, it depends on two times. It depends on the time that we are currently busy with, time t or time u, and exactly the amount of time that we have been in the sixth state. Okay, so we just know that that row depends on um, a function that depends on time and the amount of time in the sixth state. We still have to define the explicit parameters and functions we want to estimate for each of that, but we just know it will depend on only those two numbers. Okay, and this seems quite complicated at the start, but if you break it down in all the possibilities on the outside integral, and then you run through the, the events on your timeline, you should be able to write expressions like this quite naturally. And this is a slightly simpler example to the Kolmogorov forward and um, backward equations, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Okay, getting back to these three points, I'm now going to address what's, we want to say that if someone has been very sickly, if they have a, a long track record of being sick, um, we want to make sure that we um, account for that history and that the probability of getting sick again is probably higher than before. So that's how we dealt with it in this picture. So it's similar to the time, um, the discrete time case, but you start off in a healthy state and you leave for the sick state depending on time. But once you've been declared sick from this, health, this first healthy state, you can never return. So when you recover from the sick state, depending also on how long you have been sick, you recover to, to this healthy tainted state, this H negative state. And from this state, you can again get sick. This time it depends on how long you've been healthy. Um, and from any of these states, you can actually go to the dead state. So this diagram is currently um, leaving out these two arrows for dead. This is probably mu t and mu, let's say, oh, let's make this mu 2 t and make that mu 1 t without it looking like a derivative. 
Um, there we go. So we are only discerning between people who have been sick once uh, or more versus someone who has never been sick. And there's nothing that stops us from introducing more healthy tainted states. It's just that we're going to require an explosive amount of data to estimate those parameters. So the first thing we just want to do is to uh, make the, small, the, the least onerous assumption that we can as a starting point, and then rather over time test if the mark of property holds. So this is our, as we had in the discrete case, this is our way of getting around this model requirement. But to truly get over this model requirement to account for all possible sickness histories that a person can have, you'll probably require more data than anyone has available. So the question is always, does the mark of property hold? You'll test for the mark of property. Um, and if it doesn't hold, then we know we have to, we can, we can basically make the claim that we don't think we can mo uh, model this problem uh, reliably. We'll need to collect more data to do it better. But if the mark of property hold, we can probably make the claim that we seem to be doing fine by just making this one distinction between people. So on the last slide, we have an alternative uh, to the forward and backward differential equations that we have from the start of this section. Um, the ones from the start of the section are always what you would try first. You wouldn't just go straight into the integrated form, but the integrated form uh, is an alternative expression depending on the information you have available. You can think, you can see that their logic is very similar to the example we just did, the probability of going from I to K, the probability of instantly moving to a particular state, and then the probability of staying in that state. Um, I said that the best way to get these questions sorted um, is to uh, do a lot of examples, and you can probably see these integrated forms of, um, of the question as your first examples to work through. The notes has two or three more such examples. Um, hopefully you can get them to, to the bottom of them. I've looked at a whole bunch of textbooks um, and more examples on these are actually quite few and far between. Um, so you, if you're looking for more questions, uh, feel free to get in touch. I can have a, a little bit of a look for more examples, but definitely only do that once you've looked in detail through the ones in the notes.